In this example, we want to look at another application of our separable differential equations. So we're told that a tank contains 20 kilograms of salt, which is dissolved in 5,000 liters of water. Brine, uh, that contains three hundredths of a kilogram of salt per liter, enters the tank at a rate of 25 liters per minute. If the solution inside the tank is always thoroughly mixed, so there's the same amount of concentration of salt at the top and bottom of the tank, uh, and the solution drains at the same rate of 25 liters per minute, so there's no net gain in volume of solution in the tank, then how much salt is in the tank after 30 minutes have passed by? So in order to answer this question, we're gonna have to set up and solve a differential equation. So let's go ahead and carefully define what our variables are gonna represent here. And so what we're asked for is how much salt is in the tank after 30 minutes. So we're gonna to wanna to solve our differential equation and have that solution represent the quantity of salt in the tank. So Y is gonna represent the amount of salt in kilograms in our tank at any moment of time. And we could let uh, X represent time in minutes here, but let's go ahead and mix things up a little bit and let T represent time. And our units are minutes for the quantity of salt. Our units are kilograms. And so we're gonna to have to carefully set up a differential equation that models this situation. And so let's start by thinking about the rate of change of this quantity dy dt. Well, our derivative here would represent the instantaneous rate of change of the amount of salt in this tank with respect to time. And it's a pretty difficult uh, quantity to think of just on its own. It'll be easier if we think of it as two separate pieces that we put together, right? We can kind of break this into two simpler pieces because the rate of change of the amount of salt in our tank is gonna come down to how much salt is coming into our tank and how much salt is leaving our tank. So we can think of this as the rate in minus the rate out of our tank. And so the units for the amount describing the rate in and the rate out should match with the units of our derivative, which are gonna be kilograms of salt per minute. So we're gonna have to figure out as a rate in, how many kilograms of salt per minute are entering our tank, and as a rate out, how many kilograms per minute of salt are leaving our tank. And so we're told that brine is being poured into the tank or entering it in some way at a rate of 3 hundredths of a kilogram of salt per liter at a rate of 25 liters per minute. So we know that there are 3 hundredths of a kilogram per liter of water. That's part of the rate, but notice our units at the moment will be kilograms per liter. We want our units to be kilograms per minute. So we know for each liter entering the tank of the brine, 0 0.03 kilograms of salt are inside of that liter. But how many liters are coming into the tank per minute? Well, we're told that 25 liters of this brine is being introduced into our tank per minute. And now if we multiply these rates together, we get the desired rate we want, describing the rate of the amount of salt entering our tank per minute. Let's see, those units of liters cancel out very nicely. Multiply that together, we get 0 0.75. And now our units are kilograms per minute, which is exactly what we needed. And we'll now we need to run through the exact same process for the rate out, but this one is gonna be a bit trickier because we're not given that information explicitly. We're gonna have to describe this using a variable. But there is one piece we do know about this rate out, and that is that the amount of uh, solution actually leaving the tank is the same as the amount that is being introduced into the tank, and so that's gonna be 25 liters per minute. So that missing factor as part of our rate out expression is that factor that describes the concentration of salt per liter in our tank. And this is gonna be a bit more complex than the rate in because, well, this is describing the water that's already in our tank and is leaving our tank. And as we introduce this brine into our tank, the amount of salt in our tank is gonna be constantly changing, right? The amount of salt in the brine that is being introduced is constant, that is never changing, but it's affecting the concentration of the salt that is already in the tank, and so this is gonna make it a variable quantity. But we know about this rate is that it's gonna be the amount of salt in the tank divided by the volume of the tank. 
right? That is how we describe the concentration of the salt in the tank at any moment in time. It's just the total amount of salt in kilograms divided by the total volume of solution in the tank. That'll give you your concentration rate. Well, we know the total volume of solution in our tank at any time is gonna be 5,000 liters, right? And that volume is never changing because the rate in and the rate out are the same. We're gaining and losing 25 liters at every moment. But now we need to know how much uh, salt is actually in the tank at any moment in time. And well, that's not gonna be a number, that's gonna be a variable, that's actually gonna be our solution function Y. That is exactly what Y is describing, is the quantity of salt in kilograms at any moment in time. So now if we multiply these together, again, we can see our units of liters cancel out, leaving us units of kilograms for Y and minutes in the denominator, giving us our desired rate of kilograms of salt per minute. But now we just have to simplify this. 25Y over 5,000 is the same as Y over 200. So putting this information, we can now write our differential equation down. We know the instantaneous rate of change of the number of kilograms of salt in this tank at any moment in time is gonna be equal to the rate in minus the rate out. The rate in was 0 0.75 kilograms per minute, and we, or three fourths, and we have to subtract away from that y kilograms over 200. And for the sake of eventually solving this differential equation, it'll actually be easier if we write the right-hand side as a single fraction. That common denominator would have to be uh, 200, and so that would end up looking like 150 minus y all over 200. We just had to multiply that three fourths by 50 over 50 to get that common denominator. Well, so far, all of our work has really just been setting up uh, the differential equation that we need to solve to find our general solution and then answer the question of interest. And so we know our differential equation is dy over dt is equal to 150 minus y over 200. And now we can separate this equation, move all the quantities involving y on the left-hand side. That'll look like 1 over 150 minus y dy. And that'll be equal to all the quantities involving t on the other side. That'll be 1 over 200 times the differential of t. I just divided both sides by 150 minus y and multiplied both sides by the differential of t. And so now we can integrate both sides of that differential equation now that the variables have been separated. And we're one step closer to finding the solution to this differential equation. And so if we integrate the left-hand side with respect to y, just using a u substitution, we should find that that antiderivative is negative one times the natural log of the absolute value of that quantity, 150 minus y. And then that's gonna be equal to the antiderivative of that right-hand side, where we are integrating with respect to t, the constant one over 200. Well, that antiderivative is just gonna be one over 200 times t plus some constant c. So now let's go ahead and try to find our explicit solution. We wanna solve for y in terms of our other variable t here. And so to help us do this, I might first get that negative sign out of the way. Just multiply both sides by negative one to do that. And we get negative t over 200 minus c. Remember, this c is just some arbitrary constant of integration. It could be positive or it could be negative. So let's just leave it as a positive c, where c1 is equal to negative c. This is actually a pretty common thing that happens when you're working with these differential equations. As you start integrating and doing these processes, you get multiple uh, constants like this showing up and they kind of get combined together and manipulated. And we tend to just relabel them and a lot of the times we don't even describe it as well as we were doing over here, we'll just again call this C, C again, and not describe that, well, really it's different, it was multiplied by negative one, but it's an arbitrary constant. All right, so our next step would be to exponentiate both sides of our differential equation. That would give us 150 minus y on the left-hand side, and that'd be equal to e to the power of negative t over 200 plus c1 on the right-hand side. Although technically, 
this should be the absolute value of 150 minus y is equal to this exponential. And then we can actually simplify the right hand side as we saw earlier. Think of this as like e to the power of c1 times e to the negative t over 200. And then we'll call this e to the c1 c2 instead. All right, so at the moment we know the absolute value of 150 minus our solution y is equal to some constant that we're calling c2 times e to the power of negative t over 200. And so now there's a couple things we can do at this point to make more progress with this problem, uh, but they're all kind of working towards getting rid of those absolute values around the quantity 1 minus 50y. Uh, one thing we can do at the moment, which we also could have done earlier if we wanted to, is find the value of c2. So what we know is initially the uh, container contains 20 kilograms of salt. So if we were to write that as an initial condition, then y of zero would be equal to 20. So if we use that information to help us find C2 here, we know that 150 minus 20 is gonna be equal to C2 times e to the power of negative t over 200, but t is equal to zero. So that goes e to the zero. Well, that's equal to one. So C2 is the absolute value of 150 minus 20. So C2 is just the constant 130. And so now to help us figure out how we can eventually get rid of these absolute value signs around the quantity 150 minus y, we need to notice that our y value, which is the quantity of salt in our tank in kilograms, is always gonna be between 20 and 150. So this lower bound of 20 just comes from the initial amount of salt in our uh, tank, 20 kilograms, and the amount of 150 comes from the, uh, the thought of, well, what if our tank uh, was just filled completely with 5,000 liters of brine? Well, we'd have 5,000 liters of brine, where each liter of brine has 0 0.3 kilograms of salt per liter. And well, 5,000 times 3 hundredths gives us 150. And so what this little analysis tells us is that, well, if Y is always between uh, 20 and 150, Worst case scenario, it's 20, and we get 130 on the left-hand side. Best case scenario, it's 150, although maybe that's depending on your perspective, and we get zero on the left-hand side. Either way, the left-hand side is always gonna be greater than or equal to zero. And if something is always greater than or equal to zero, we don't really need the absolute values around it anymore. So now that we know what to do with those absolute value signs, we can finish this example off, or at least find the solution by solving for y. Just add y to each side and subtract this exponential. Either way, we shouldn't end up with y is gonna be equal to 150 minus 130 times e to the power of negative t over 200. So we're not quite done with this example. We got all the hard stuff out of the way. Remember the last thing we were asked is how much salt is in the tank after 30 minutes have passed by? Well, I'm gonna to need to reclaim a little bit more board space to answer that, but basically we just have to plug in T equals 30 into the solution equation that we have found. So to finish this off, let's find out how many kilograms of salt are in the tank 30 minutes later. It'll be 150 minus 130 times E to the power of negative 30 over 200. And if we enter that into our calculator, what we should end up with is about 38.1 kilograms. So after 30 minutes have passed by in this setup, there's gonna be about 38.1 kilograms of salt in this tank. And this isn't part of the problem, but another cool thing we can notice about this situation, this model and the setup is, well, if we're just let this tank continue, having this brine pumped into it, Eventually, once enough time passes by, uh, it should be like it was purely brine the entire time, right? That initial fluid and concentration would get kind of sucked out and replaced totally with brine. And well, that means in the end behavior of this function, if we let time go on towards infinity, it should be as if the tank was filled with only brine. And what we know, if the tank was filled with only brine, there'd be 150 kilograms of salt in that tank. Well, if we take the limit as t approaches infinity of our function that describes the amount of salt in our tank, this exponential piece is gonna to go to zero 
as t approaches infinity, so it'll disappear, leaving us just a constant of 150. So as time goes on, the concentration of salt in our tank is increasing from 20 kilograms, uh, increasing towards eventually 150 kilograms of salt, but never more than 150 kilograms of salt.